There's a shock. When I uh, when I first started working with you good folks, I remember one of my friends that uh, back in Denver I worked with, she had the audacity to ask me, do they know you? <laughs> I said, yes, they know me. And then she says, and they hired you anyway? <laughs> so, but anyway, when I first started, after the gospel meeting with Gary Summers was over, we began studying in Second uh, First Thessalonians chapter four. We we should be in. No, I'm not going to say. That. First Thessalonians chapter four, and I noticed the word beseech came up in verse one, and then it came up in verse ten, and it'll come up some more in Second Thessalonians. And then I preached a sermon from the book of Romans, and in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, there's that word beseech again. I preached a sermon on Philemon, and in verse 9, that word is used again. And Brother uh, Hatcher gave me a list, I think it was Monday, to preach from. You know, the any time the elder gives you some paperwork and oh, this would be good sermons, you know what that means. <laughs> no, he wasn't pushing me, but uh, I was already intrigued, already interested, and he found the word comes up 22 times in the New Testament. That would include Hebrews because it comes up twice in Hebrews. And now, of course, we know that the author is God himself, but most people believe that Paul wrote Hebrews because the similarity of writings is, is exactly the same. You could read 2 Timothy 4, and then you could go into Hebrews chapter 12, verse uh, 1, or chapter 1, verse 1, and, and not miss anything. You would think it was the same writer. But 22 times, which is interesting. So I already preached from Romans. We already talked about First Thessalonians, uh, preached from Philemon. But there's another passage that came to mind. And this is one that we're all familiar with. And that is Romans chapter 16, verse 17. And by the way, when I referred to it as a favorite word of Paul, and it was, I believe. But why? Why did he use that word so much? Well, first, it was because he was told to. He was inspired by God to use it. But I think there may be another reason, and this is just my personal opinion, and that and 15 bucks will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. But you think about these congregations that the Apostle Paul started throughout Asia Minor, throughout Europe. And we're looking at members of the church who were basically new converts. They were new Christians. And the majority came out of paganism. They were Gentiles. So they had been worshiping a plurality of gods. Now they were just worshiping and being faithful to the one true God. Now, parents, you remember when you had young children at home, you knew the importance of trying to instruct them, to teach them how to act, and probably even beg them from time to time to do what was right. That's what Paul's doing here. Now, that word beseech, if you remember right, comes from a Greek word, parakaleo. Now the word para means to the side of. And kaleo means to call, to call to one side. And that can be done in a number of different ways, or a number of different definitions. 
It can be exhortation, entreaty, comfort, instruction. That's how Thayer defines it. But you could also include to implore or to beg them to do this, them to do that. And in using this word throughout the New Testament, a lot of times Paul is addressing problems within the church. Like the problems of division. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, I believe that word beseech is found there as well. The division that was ongoing there at Corinth, he addressed. And he addresses it with the church in Rome as well. And that last chapter, along with all the salutations that he was making to the brethren and the churches of Christ salute you. All the different congregations throughout the world were saluting the church at Rome. He states in verse 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. That's, a, again, a passage that faithful congregations are very well of. If you're not in a faithful congregation, you may never have even heard of that verse. Now, that being said, what was so important that Paul would use that terminology for the church at Rome? Either there was ongoing problems or he knew there would be problems that would arise. So divisions and then the word offenses, two different words of course. The word division is defined as dissension, parties or a party spirit. We talked about factions earlier in Bible class this morning. Barnes defines it as that, as factions. And also they that work to cause these things to come about. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a false teacher. But someone who's drawing away brethren by doing something that's unscriptural. I remember there was a brother here a number of years ago that my dad mentioned when he was an elder that he was trying to get people involved in a political pursuit. And the elders talked to him privately and tried to tell him, this stays out. This is not part of the work of the church. If you want to teach something like this outside of the church, that's up to you, but not in. He wouldn't stop, and guess what? they had to withdraw from him because he was causing problems in the Lord's church is condemned. So it's not just false teachers, but many times that's how we refer to it as. The offenses. This is where we get the English word scandal from. This is defined as the trigger of the trap. Well, you think about that phrase, you know what it's talking about, I think. You think about traps for, for wild animals out in the forest. Once they step into that trap, it sets a trigger and they are caught. In this case, they're leading people to sin. They are casting before others a stumbling block, if you will. And if there was one group, and Paul doesn't come out explicitly and address this, but if there was one group who was caught up in factions or the party spirit and leading others astray is the Judaizing teachers. I mean, this, this is them. This is their moniker. And you think about the Jews. They love the party spirit. They were broken up themselves in factions. You had the Sadducees. You had the Pharisees. You had the Zealots. You had the Essenes and others. And you had these Judaizing teachers who were Jews who obeyed the gospel of Christ. Unfortunately, they didn't accept everything. But what they were doing is teaching the Gentiles 
before you can obey the gospel, you need to obey the law of Moses first. You had to be circumcised first to do this. And it seems like wherever Paul went, they were following him. So they definitely were a thorn in his side. So Paul had to address it. Just like the elders at Bellevue over the years have had to address false teachings. Even before it got here. Well, it's not going to happen here. It's somewhere else. It will. Unless you deal with it. So two different things. One is that party spirit, a faction, while the other is the person who leads others into sin. So what were they to do? They were to mark them. What does that mean? You're to keep your eye on them. Attentively, you were to keep your eye on that that kind of person, that kind of individual, to watch them, to behold, to contemplate what they are trying to do. Now here it is not used in a good sense, but in other places it is in a good sense. That to keep your eye on. Sometimes it's for good examples. Philippians chapter 3 verse 7, Paul addressing Christians, brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them, keep your eye on them, which walk or live in the right way. To walk, to live, so as ye have us for an example, an example. We've all known brethren over the years who were faithful. I mean, you knew exactly where they were going to sit on Sunday morning. They will sit right where Dot's sitting right now. That was their spot. And if they weren't here, you know they were sick or they were out of town. But they were faithful Christians. And for the young growing up in the Lord's church, set your eye upon someone like that who's setting that kind of example to learn from them how to live the Christian life. And that's what Paul is talking about here. But Romans 16, 17, that's not what he's dealing with. They were to mark them. Some have stated, well, yes, okay, you're to mark that individual, but that doesn't mean you have to withdraw from them. Well, I guess that's true if you stop right there. And anybody who uses that excuse is, well, I'm not going to use the word stupid. I, I just won't do that. But that's not someone who's very smart, for, for sure. But along with marking them, they were to avoid them. The ASV reads, to turn away from them. Thayer's defines it as to shun them. This is the opposite of fellowship. I don't understand why this is so difficult to contemplate, to understand, because I have known this since I was a boy growing up here. I've known that. It was taught in the pulpit. It was taught in the classroom. It was taught at home. You can't fellowship individuals like this, whether they're teaching false doctrine or through some other ploy, for whatever proud reason they're leading people astray. And I couldn't help but think, what if these colleges, we refer to, or we used to, Christian colleges, I don't know one anymore, but what if they actually practice what Romans 16, 17 teaches? What if they continue to practice 2 John 9 through 11, Ephesians 5, 11, for example? They would have been putting out young men and women out into the world who were faithful, not leading people in the congregations that they went to astray. And I remember one brother talking about the Memphis School of Preaching that they do not believe these verses. They do not believe. And he stated 2 John 9 through 11. 
but they also don't believe Romans 16, 17 because they're not practicing it. But what if they did? These schools are preaching that once we're faithful would be sending out young men to preach the gospel who were faithful. But they don't do that anymore. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, Ephesians 5.11. Now we talked about the hairy tick earlier today. In Titus 3, verse 10, a man that is an heretic, one who has that faction spirit, after the first and second admonition, what were they to do? They were to reject that individual. They were to withdraw from them, refuse to avoid them. But why was Paul telling the brethren at Rome to avoid, to mark individuals like this? Simply put, what they were teaching, what they were practicing was causing or would cause others to turn away from the doctrine of Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 is another passage that we sometimes or want to go to. It states, now we command you. Now hold it right there. A command. In other words, that's an order. We command, we order you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, by his authority, that they will withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. Disorderly. Out of rank, out of step is what that word means. This is an old military term. And some of you old folks who've been in the military, you know what that means. Some of you who are in the Army or in the Marine Corps, the Navy. By the way, the Air Force didn't march. We got on planes and they took us places. But if you were marching in a parade ground, and we did at graduation ceremonies, you know what it means to be out of step. You've got this long line. There's lines in front of you, lines behind you. And you are all in order when you are stepping forth. If someone in front of you was out of step, guess what? You're going to be out of step. The person behind you was going to be out of step. It would be a ripple effect until that old Navy chief or that sergeant came back and started yelling at you to get back in line. But this is the effect that it would have. This is the effect that this would have in the Lord's church as well that sin would just grow within a congregation. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Didn't you know this? Evidently they didn't. They were glorying in this misdeed. This man who had his father's wife, he told them to withdraw from that individual. And they did. Guess what? It worked. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 2. But God's way always works. No matter what. It always works. In physical terms, you think of an individual who has been diagnosed with cancer. If it's caught in time, a lot of times they will cut that cancer out of the body. So that person's life can be spared. That's one reason why we withdraw fellowship in the Lord's church. It is an order. It is a command. But there's reasons behind it. One is, like with the brother at Corinth who had his father's wife, they will miss that fellowship. They will re realize what they've done is wrong, and they will repent of it and come back and be restored. But if they don't, they have to be removed from the body so the body can remain pure. It can be faithful. That cancer's been removed. And people today will say, well, that's, that's just wrong. That's, that's not loving at all. You know what's not loving? Too scared to do God's will. And watch that individual who has sinned and continues to sin 
march off to hell. And as the scriptures teach, the elders are going to be held accountable for that. They watch over our souls. But we'll also be accountable if we allow it to happen ourselves. When we think about 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we think of how they made a mockery of the Lord's church. And in the midst of that discussion, you have this one pearl. We have many of them. But it's in verse 19. 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen, For there must, that's interesting, for there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Well, what in the world is that talking about? All this division, all these problems at Corinth, Paul's saying, and he's inspired to write this, there are always going to be these heresies. There's going to be these factions, and they must happen. So that those who are approved, and those who are faithful, will be made manifest, and that word means to be made known before others, that you are on the Lord's side. And he's watching. There's a song that we sing, Who Will Follow Jesus?, standing for the right, holding up the banner, his banner, in the thickest fight. That's a question there. Listening for his orders, ready to obey, who will follow Jesus serving him today? Question mark. And this hymn ends in a question mark. So are we on the Lord's side? Or are we not? And there's no in-betweens. Factions, American Standard Version defines it that way. 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. Think in our time, going back, say, 50 years, how many false doctrines have been taught and have crept into the Lord's church itself? Now think of how many people have been led astray through other avenues. Too many. And so many congregations no longer are the Lord's church because of these outcomes. And when division comes to a congregation, and Bellevue has seen its share of divisions and breakups going back into the late 60s to now, it's difficult. But when it all, the dust clears as the saying goes, and the heretics leave. There's no doubt that that congregation, Bellevue in the past, has been smaller in number, but it's also purer. And God's watching this. And he's watching those who have stood for him. Brother Dor uh, George Darling he was a fiery gospel preacher. And he talked about divisions in the church and well, we don't want to do anything because it will, it will rip the church apart. He basically had to say, let it rip, let it happen. First Corinthians eleven nineteen says, these things must take place. It reminds me of 1 John 2, 19, the apostle of love. They went out from us, but they were not of us. I think of the Memphis School of Preaching for myself. They were not of us. They acted like it, but they weren't. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest, made known that they were not all of us. And division hurts. You lose, you lose friends. One of the divisions here at Bellevue, my mother said she lost her best friend. And sometimes you lose family members. But we need to remember where our loyalty, our love really lies. And that's with, with our God. Not with the school, but with God. 
Matthew 10, 37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's a pretty powerful statement. Well, that just about sums Romans 16, 17 up. So we're about ready to go home, right? No. Because if you're studying this verse, you also know you also have to look at the next verse. Verse 18 of Romans 16, 18. For. That's a word that is a conjunction. That is a word that's giving the reason behind verse 17. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. The ASV has the innocent. Basically, they are in it for themselves. They don't care one whit about you as long as you keep paying them, as long as you keep bowing down and kissing their ring, make sure that they still have the power of the prestige. That's all they care about. They do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but they have submitted themselves to their own fleshly desires. We can either be slaves to the world or we can be willing slaves to our Lord and Savior. There's no in between. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, Matthew 6, 24. And I come across 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, when talking about or studying this. And truly what it, the effect that it had to have on Paul. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He was a faithful soldier of Christ who'd been with Paul, worked with him on missionary journeys. Here he is in prison in Rome once again the second time, and he's not going to get out this time. You read 2 Timothy chapter 4, especially 6 through 8, it seems like he realizes any minute they were going to come, take him out of that cell, and execute him. And at the time where he needed Demas most, Demas forsook him. Everybody else was gone except for Luke. Everybody else was doing the Lord's will except this man. He turned his back upon Paul in his greatest time of need. But he didn't turn his back just upon Paul. He turned his back upon God. He turned his back upon God's holy work that they were involved in. He turned his back on his only hope for salvation. And what a price he paid. Because if he didn't come to himself as the prodigal son did, he has been in torment all of this time. And there's no getting out except right into hell after the day of judgment. And if we could talk to him right now, if we would ask him, was it worth it? We know what he'd say. No. Because he's in torment in hell. In torment. Terrible pain. James, in warning the Christians of worldliness, stated, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. James 4, verse 4. We've all had enemies. One enemy we don't want to have, that's God. That will not end well, folks. So the question is not to whom they serve, in this case, this individual, but what they serve. Their own belly. Now, before we go into this any further, there are men who preach false doctrine, but they actually believe what they are preaching is the truth. They're wrong. Many of the denominations do that. They're sincere about what they preach. They're sincerely wrong about it. 
Then there are individuals, even the Lord's church, who will teach something that's false, and once they're corrected, will turn right around. They will not teach that again. They will teach the truth on that <coughs> subject. Apollos comes to mind. This individual that we're reading about this afternoon, that doesn't apply to them at all, these two examples. They teach false doctrine. They lead astray for money, for their own fleshly appetites, for power, for prestige. You think about the televangelists, they come to mind. They are in it for the money. The Oral Roberts in his time. He knows better, by the way. And there's plenty in the Lord's church are in this category. I'm not just talking about the, the Rubel Shelleys or the Max Lucados, but those who are even further down the rank who teach false doctrine for their own belly purposes. They don't care about you and I. They don't care about God or they wouldn't do it. They are hypocrites. They pretend to be the most good, the most kind, the most caring individuals you will ever meet. Sweetness just drips off them. Unless you stand against them with the truth, and then, as my dad used to say, they become meaner than a junkyard dog. And they are. They'll bite and devour you. But their sermons are syrupy sweet. They're not going to preach anything that offends. No condemnation. No censor. They won't speak evil of anybody or anything, including Satan. Now, he's just misunderstood. It's not his fault. But that's who these individuals are. Jesus stated, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves, Matthew 7, 15. It's a great comparison to the people in this verse here. In Colorado, I think it was about a year, maybe two years ago, they started to introduce wolves. There's a lot of ranches and farms there. You know what's going to happen. A wolf will do what a wolf does. And one wolf killed a calf over on the western slope. Not evil. It's just what they do. It was hungry. Here's easy prey. So it killed it. I'm sure it partially ate that calf. But when a wolf attacks prey, it rends, it tears, it is absolutely vicious. Nothing compared to these false teachers, though. And they do it spiritually. Sadly, many in the Lord's Church today they want to hear the kind of preaching that these false teachers are preaching. They don't want book, chapter, and verse anymore. Not for me. No, thank you. I want to hear something different. Paul wrote of that as well. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. These are messages these individuals can, I hate to use the word preach, speeches that they give. That could be spoken of in any denomination in town today. It will sound just the same. There's no difference because it's not God's word. My dad Okay, here we go. My dad was up in the Seattle area. He was seeing his uh, granddaughter who was uh, stationed at the Navy on Whidbey Island. They made a movie from that place years ago. 
Sunday came around and he went to worship with the Church of Christ, at least that's what it said. The preacher had just got off vacation. Guess what his sermon was on? It wasn't from the book. It was about his vacation. Knowing my dad, he just stayed long, long enough to find out how far is this man going to go? When I was preaching in Cheyenne, there was a rather large con congregation on the other side of town. Uh, that wasn't High Plains, by the way. But we had some visitors, and they were from Florida one Sunday. They had went to the large congregation that morning they chose us that afternoon. Uh, we met at the scriptural time of 6, uh, 6 p.m., by the way. <laughs> but uh, after the sermon, two of the men came up to me and wanted to thank me for opening up the book. Well, that's, that's my job. That's the preacher's job, preach the gospel. But he mentioned that the preacher at the other congregation didn't mention even one verse in his sermon. The closest he got was to alluding to a passage. That's the closest. That was that congregation. And they lied to their membership by telling their members that we were the ones who were liberal. They lied because they didn't want them to know the truth. Well, so what is the outcome with all of this? And by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Then that's the New King James Version. American Standard Version, and by their smooth and fair speech, they beguile the hearts of the innocent or the harmless. I was working on this uh, this last week and I thought to myself, I can't believe that J.D. Tant ever preached something with flowery speech, trying to beguile the members, smooth words. You know anything about him? Yeah, it wasn't the way he preached. It was the truth and it was fiery. I think he even had a pistol on the pulpit or on him while he preached the gospel. One brother referred to them as religious con men that we have in the Lord's church today. That's a good analogy. Satan used this and still uses this tactic. I'm going to close with Proverbs 14, 15. It reads, The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going, how he lives, the direction that he's going in. Not the simple, and we don't want to be the simple. So we can understand why Paul implored, beseeched, begged these brethren to be watchful of those who would lead them astray. That is the elder's job here at Bellevue. But also, in a sense, that's all of our jobs, to mark them who are out of step, who are either teaching something false and that usually starts, they come in, as Michael stated earlier, privily, privately. They have their small little groups or cliques. Before you know it, the congregation is gone. We need to watch them. We need to avoid them. Cannot have any fellowship with them. They deceive and beguile. They lead astray, and they'll lead our souls astray if we let them. So with that being said, are, are we of this afternoon of the prudent, or are we of the simple? Which is a good question to ask, and even ask now. If you're not a child of God, you need to be. Because if you're not, you have absolutely no hope of salvation. You can attend as many denominations as you want, but that's not the Lord's church. This is.
And it will be as long as we continue to stand on the principles that we know we need to stand on. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized for the remission of sins, and then he will add us to his church. If as children of God, are we of the prudent or have we become simple? Now the word would be foolish. If you need the prayers of the church on your behalf this afternoon, we pray, beseech, beg you to make your wishes known. Let's all stand and sing.